to a point where you can't even have this auditorium. Um, so thank you very much. Um, They're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why do you do that? I want to have a conversation today about what it means to do social justice work. And I think we all in the room, because you're in the room, we all kind of agree that social justice work is important. It's something that we all should do. But I want to have a different conversation with you all today. I want to have a conversation that says, in order to do social justice work, you have to know something about people. So the idea is that, oh, I want to do social justice work, I want to go out, I want to help people. Right. But before you go out and help people, before you do this particular type of work, what I want to argue today is that you have to know something about them. And not just the things that play. Not just all, all the statistics that tell you that black and brown people are underachieving or they're poor or they're poverty. None of those. I want to argue today that honestly do social justice work. And to be committed to social change is to know close greatness. And to start with greatness first. Not with all the narratives that tell you that folks can't do this, this is their plight, how hard it is. Those things are real. But if you only know those things, you can't help you. Because you will also buy into stereotypes. Even when you're trying to do the social justice work. Because all you know about them are was plaguing them, but you don't want to do So I want to have a conversation today that says to do social justice work, you have to start with folks' greatness. In December of 2018, a few months ago, I had the opportunity to go to Ghana. Ghana! Ghana! There you go! <laughs> now, if you consider yourself African American in this room, you don't need to do a 23 me DNA test. You can give me that night.
You take your last bath, you're being branded and getting just enough food to eat. And then you get to the coast of Ghana. And you will spend two to 12 weeks in what they call the castles. Now, I don't think there's any castle, anything fairy tale about these. Those are about 40 castles that they have on the coast of Ghana. And that is what you call a dungeon. So that is the top of the castle. The bottom of the castles are nothing but dungeons. And you can stay there for two to 12 weeks. Now in the dungeon, you can still see it today, is a canal. And that canal is for Europe. In the back is a trench for feces. And if you die, you just were there. 240 miles on foot. You take your last bath, and then you will stay two to 12 weeks in the dungeon. Feces, urine, and dead bodies all around you in complete darkness. You made it through that. You lived through that. You then had two to 12 weeks on a boat to the New Americas. Again, in feces, dead bodies. So what I want to argue today is that these individuals who made it here and made it to Columbia and made it to the West Indies, they are superhumans. Think about that. Look at what they went through, look at what they lived through, and they are here today. That means that somebody in my DNA went through all of that for me to be here. Somebody that I will never know. Walked 240 miles on foot, took their last bath, survived the dungeons, survived the ships, then to come here and live a life of bondage. And I'm standing here before That's the story we don't tell. So to understand greatness, to understand social justice work, you have to understand this. I am not a descendant of slaves. I'm a descendant of human beings who were enslaved. Look at this. 
that gives me that all music, pretty much all music that we, we popularize today comes out of Africa. But look, at every point, they resist it with their art, with their creativity, with their imagination. That's what it also means to be a social justice warrior. To resist with your art, with your creative, to be creative. And look at these individuals. We get blues during the slave era. We get living in blues during the civil rights. We get hip hop during the destruction of urban areas. And I don't know what this will be over here, but we will create. And so to do this work is to know our greatness. So we're gonna play a song for you.
Women in Colombia during the slave era. When you saw a woman with the uh, boxer braids, the Kardashians like to call boxer braids, the black folks call like plaques, they were about to depart. That's why they had a part in their hair. What I'm talking to you is people who use everything for freedom, everything for justice, from their food to their hair to their music. Wade in the water, children, wade in the water. Why do you wade in the water? You get in the water, get that scent off you, and you wade, don't swim to make more sure. Quilts. Ooh, everything was about freedom. You might see the beauty in that. Before you want to do work in social justice spaces, you might see the beauty in that, the creativity in that, the ingenuity in that, the love and the drive in that. So one of my favorite quotes by Nikki Giovanni is that style has a profound meaning to black Americans. If we can't drive, we want to be lost. The world will envy our disturbing our, disturb, our, disturb, our feet. If we can't have hands, we'll grow children. And we are giving rock and pieces, we make clothes. And we are giving scraps, we make clothes. Take away our drums, we will cut our hands. We prove that the human spirit will prevail. We will take what we have to make what we need. We need confidence in our knowledge of who we are. Everybody thinks we need this big, big revolution. 
but everybody just did their part to all of you. And so do your part. Because at the end of the day, I know what this looks like. Um, I was born and raised in upstate New York, Rochester, New York. And I'll tell you one thing about upstate New York is being New York. Because when people say, where do you go, Rochester? That like Queen Joe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, upstate New York, I mean, I was a kid. And when I was getting my doctorate, I, was, I, was, I thought I was really smart, of course. And I was reading this book called Hip Hop Generation. And in this book, it talks about a program in upstate New York called FIST, where young people were transforming their everyday lives by activism. And when I read that book, I almost dropped it because I was in that program. When I was a little kid, between 9 and 12 years old, I was learning about activism, what it means to be an activist, what it means to do social justice work, what it means to care about people. And I went off to college and I thought these ideas that I had were actually wrong. <laughs> I had forgotten that they were indoctrinated. And I used that word for the sake that's what this has to be. So I want you to know the education that you're getting now is planting a seed in you that when you need it, and you need to call on it, it will be there. I say that as somebody who's in fist and as an educator. So don't take this work for granted. Don't take this stuff, oh, diversity, oh, I get it, I know, we got this, we got that. No, 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 no. There's going to come a time in your life where you're going to need this stuff. Where this stuff is going to be important, not only to you, but to your end. And what you're learning now is so important to that. Not only makes you a better person, it makes us all better. And I thought I was that smart that I knew that. But I forgot about the wonderful teachers, the wonderful mentors that I had in my life at a very early age that ensured that this stuff not only I learned about, but became a way of life. And that's what I want you to take from this today. Learning about social justice and learning about the things that can be done is not just about you learning about it. It needs to become a way of life. It needs to become how you see the world. Because at the end of the day, I want you all to know that people closer to the pain should be closest to the power. If I'm somebody who has been hungry for 25 years, I have thought about every day. I just need you maybe to come in and make that power grab to you. Make the connections for you. So you've got to understand that as young folks doing this work, yes, you have answers, but believe me, those individuals on the ground, they have answers too. But I want to end by telling you.
involved in the city. So there's maybe 60% of the students, 60% of the student time is in the classrooms, 40% is out doing field work. Um, we have a faculty that is mixed in terms of uh, disciplines, in terms of backgrounds, um, because the city is made up of different kinds of people who think differently, approach problems differently. So there's a sociologist, an anthropologist, a historian, trying to probably get an economist and we have a policy expert. Uh, we have four different degrees. I'm from the hotel, now a teacher, and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm a fan. I'm Brian, I'm from Sutton. Uh, my pronouns are he and her, and I'm a fan. I'm Maddie, I'm from Sutton, and I am from Adam Jones from the Baltimore Orioles came to play at Fenway Park a couple of years ago. Any of you who are Red Sox aficionados, do you remember what happened when he was in the outfield? What's that? He was targeted with racist terms, the N-word. And um, fortunately, um, they also threw uh, food at him, and the people responsible were evicted uh, from Fenway Park, allegedly for life. Uh, but that's an example of explicit bias, yeah, where like the individuals who white people in our country who have always stood up to injustice and always been anti-racist. And when I learned that, I was like, oh, God, you know, so it gave me this way to see myself differently. So I try to do that for them as well. We're never going to be comfortable enough to own our part in racism. But if we can reframe it, it's not about being a bad person, it's about existing in a system that we're all part of and we've all been kind of like impacted by, um, then we can know that we're going to be racist and have uh, you know, that as part of our upbringing. And so we can look at it without feeling like we are personally a bad person. So she's about trying to break down that. At the word intersex on the previous slide. Again, it's another, it's actually a biological term. In the sex, it's a... Because they're worried just about their immediate safety. You know, are they going to go home and is a friend? Is my mom one of the high? So right now I'm doing my connections workshop and I'm having people fill out their own diversity iceberg um, to talk about what represents their identity. Um, here's 10% of what people can see, a waterline of visibility of something that you think you can tell or can't, and then what's all under the surface of a person. Um, so I'm helping, having them do that, talk about it with some other people to learn about what's diverse in this room. So thanks. I value privacy, so I need to Um, you can use this in any way you want, really. There's no right or wrong to it, and it's just for me to frame my words so that I don't sound wishy-washy because I don't want that. And you even do like a little dance and you talk, and I don't want anyone to get upset. <laughs> do you know, 
Yeah, it's yeah. true though. I feel like I gotta make it. I mean, imagine if I was like, okay, here we go, let's go, gender, this is what it is. And you'd just be like, whoa, be nice to us for educating students. Did you? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, for the sake of time, there's 15 minutes left. We're actually gonna try to speed up. We're gonna stop, and I think we're just gonna break up. So we'll just go to you. The kids will go to you. We'll go to you. Any questions? We just want you guys to feel really comfortable leaving here. With like, oh, I think I could maybe start this up. And then if you have any questions, you have our contacts. I think the PowerPoint's readily available. There's some links on there. There's some links. Um, so this workshop was about how to create a connections program in your school. So we basically told them everything that we've done, all of our mistakes, and what we found has worked, and you know, and how to basically just make it work in their school club. Um, increasing sense of powerlessness, um, a consistent experience of not being taken seriously. Um, sometimes there can be a diminishing ability to function well in the world, just feeling kind of hopeless about how things are going. Um, sometimes a sense of, of worthlessness or negative self-concept. Concept. This um, Sometimes in, a, in an effort to act out power can be the destructive act, acting out or acting in towards our towards ourselves. And then sometimes feeling under- Yes, you this is all about the question of how he spoke, their language they were speaking, right, their accent. Did anyone, have, anyone around you or parents or anyone say, mention that, there was, there was any debate or like frustration or anything was going on with the accent, or no? Right, I'm gonna tell you the debate, because at my school at Clark, you have students from different, different parts of the continent of Africa. Right? So when we have our black panel panel, our, our panel, some of the students are like annoyed yeah. at the sort of inconsistency. Let's just pull together. We've had okay. great Thank conversations you. over here, and I'm sure in the other groups, we've learned a lot too. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for coming to this session. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you. I know that we've benefited a lot from hearing what you had to say. And I hope that when you go back to your school, you'll be able to share some of the things that you've talked about. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
did was I gave out a case study about colonial Virginia, Jamestown, which everyone studies in school. But what people might not know is that even in Jamestown, Virginia, there were questions about gender. And so what we're doing is having students and teachers look, through, look at Jamestown through the lens of gender. And using a particular case, it's all based on primary and secondary source materials, about Thomas or Thomasine Hall, whose gender identity was a bit of a concern for the community outside of Jamestown, Virginia. And that's what they're doing.
So is there some perhaps income privilege at work in uh, this practice in school of assigning projects? Assuming that students have excess income, have disposable income, in order to go out and um, get those supplies. What about this practice, holding parent-teacher conferences only in the evening? Anyone have that at their school? Parent-teacher conferences only in the evening. Does that reflect some privilege? Unprivileged. Class privilege. Yeah. And disadvantage, right? The, the flip side of the coin of privilege is always disadvantage. Whose school has ever held a donation drive? Yeah, have you held a donation drive? What kind of donations? Coat and shoe drive to make a difference. Coat and shoe drive. Yeah, we just had a summer. Was there a prize or a contest for the most coats and shoes donated? No, the only thing we did is I just wanted to raise that to say. Mm-hmm. Whatever, you know, a basketball game. If you buy the coats and shoes, you got to be here for free. Yeah. Yeah, so even rewarding the bringing of the coats and the shoes. Is there some privilege at work here? Or that they swiftly replace every year, you know, their coats and their shoes and so on. Um, or that they have money to purchase to extra. Um, we had a we had a food drive recently and um, at Bridgewater, and um, you know, the, the, I had several students come to me and say, you know, I would love to participate in the food drive, but I need all my food. <laughs> I need all the food in my cupboards. Um, and so they they were excluded uh, by this practice of people of color. What do you do about that? Who do you speak to? Do you become sort of the pain faculty member? My kids go to the same school district that I teach in, and um, I've written two separate notes to teachers in two separate grades about you know dress dress your turkey up like an Indian. What does that mean? Right. What can we not use this word to describe a group of individuals and and then it as a costume. Yeah. Like, so uh, I feel like the pain. Yes. And please bring in a gift that's a boy gift or a girl gift, depending on your choice. Why? What does that mean to be a boy gift or a girl gift? And I'm that pain. And I mean, even as, a, as an athletic director in school and female athletic director, having some of those biases on me. Last night, a little walk out on the ice after my team wins the state championship, they let the athletic director in front of me walk out. You know, I went to walk out and said, oh no, sorry, not parents. And I said, oh, I'm actually the athletic character, and I just wanted to like fall on the yeah. ice and just yeah. make a fool of myself yeah. and like yeah. yell and scream, but I, yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. So this is just different things where I'm actually not a parent. Yeah. I'm the athletic director, and I say it in a way, and I don't mean to say it in a mean way, but I'm offended. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I yeah, it's hard. And it, it is, it is hard. You know, um, so that, like it talks about. Your challenge is to go. To the